Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. We're so glad to have you here at the only Seventh-day Adventist church. And for those watching online, we're so glad that you're able to join us online today. We have a very special service planned, and we're finishing the third sermon in our first of three sermons on three, our three series. And if that's not confusing, then you're doing great. Um, But we're glad you're here. We're talking about Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in the last three days of Jesus' life, his death, and resurrection. So today we're going to look at Sunday, and I am excited. So you're in for a treat with our word and our message today. I pray that you will be blessed. Just a couple announcements. One, we do have a first reading of a transfer, Amanda Ambrose Brown, to Spencerville, and we will do a second reading for her. But never fear, those of us that know and love her, she is still committed to helping us with our music and things here, Uh, but as her daughter is transitioning to the school there, so is the mother. And those of us that live in the area understand that. I won't say any more. At any rate, we're glad that uh, the rest of you that are with us, now if you happen to look up as you were driving into our church today, you may have noticed a beautiful wood structure that now exists in our back. And we are very excited Uh, that our pavilion is built and constructed and all in place. And this was much like giving birth to a child, and it took about the same amount of time (laughs) from conception (laughs) to birth, about 10 months here. (laughs) Uh, It is here, so we are excited about that. And then uh, due to the generosity of a specific donor, uh, we have the funds now to get the picnic tables and complete it, and we can't wait to... uh, schedule our first outdoor maybe potluck or social there and that will be happening soon so just keep your eyes open for that and watch your emails and maybe i'll put a plug in if you're not on our church email it's very easy to do just email uh, us at hello at only sda.org or you can email me and i'll make sure that you get on our list and once a week we send out just one email once a week that tells you of all the upcoming things so we want you to be on that list and keep abreast of all that's happening But we're excited this has been a a long project, and with all the permitting and stuff, we're glad to see it come to fruition right before school starts, and we know our Pathfinders will get a lot of use out of it, as well as some of our other ministries. So we're glad that it is, this day has come, and I want to thank all of you that did donate to this. I know many of you contributed to make this possibility, and so thank you for your donations. That's all the announcements I have for today. I'm going to ask our worship leaders to come forward as we begin our worship service. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We invite you to stand and join us in singing our opening song this morning, Jesus Messiah. He became sin, who knew no sin. That we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Jesus 
Good morning and happy Sabbath. <laughs> Today's scripture will be John 20, verses 15 and 16. I will be reading from the New International Version. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and, and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Blessed be the gospel of our Lord. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. <laughs> hey, Rachel, what you over there doing? Just writing my check for tithe. Our check for tithe? Our check for tithe. Is there any offering included? I don't do offering. Doesn't tithe cover everything? Actually, tithe does not cover everything. Tithe covers missionary work, global work, paying our pastors. The offering pays for these lovely lights, 
the air conditioning so we can stay cool in church, pays for our supplies for Pathfinders, pays for our Sabbath school quarterlies, and even helps to pay for that pavilion that the pastor showed us that's in the back of our church. But we're in the pandemic right now, so isn't money tight? How am I supposed to be able to afford it? Well, actually, you can't afford to not pay offering. You know how sometimes we're at home and you say, Mom, I want to skip church today and stay home and watch church on TV? Yeah. So the mics that we're using, the cameras that show you up here on the stage, allows people who can't come to church to be able to join in on the fellowship. That's what our offering goes towards covering. Well, in Acts 20.35, doesn't it say it's better to give than to receive? It does. And in Proverbs 11.24, it tells you to give freely so you can receive freely. But in the pandemic, gas prices are very high and our food is getting pricey. How are we able to be afforded? Actually, Rachel, our check is really not what provides for us. God provides for us. And in our difficult times, we have to believe and trust that God will take care of all of our needs. We take care of his lovely home, and he takes care of us in our home and in our lives. Okay, I guess I'm going to trust God and pay my tithe and offering. Amen. Your offerings this, your offerings this week will benefit our church. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for the privilege to worship. Please help us to value the holy practice of giving offering and give with a cheerful heart. Bless the gifts we have brought as our worship today. Help us keep your home taken care of. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We invite you all to stand with us again as we continue our worship in music. Our next song is going to be In Christ Alone.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's good to see all of you here, even though a lot of uh, of the church family is traveling and on vacation. Good to see some of our members who are not well, but have recovered and able to come and worship with us. Greg, Jaya, we've been praying for you and the good Lord has answered our prayers. Good to see Elder Cruz and Mrs. Cruz here with us. Glad that you were able to join us. We are always blessed by your family. It is time to seek our God in prayer. Uh, but before we do that, as always, I'd like to tell you that there are many in our church family who continue to need your prayers. As some of them are not doing well. Some have uh, health challenges. Some have financial issues and other uh, challenges of life that you and I always encounter. Uh, continue to keep these folks in your prayer during your daily devotionals. Uh, if uh, any of you have something to be thankful to God, if any of you have something of concern, you're welcome to feel free to come and join me as we prepare our hearts in song and seek our God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, what a wonderful privilege it is to come to call upon thy name as your people, as we come together to worship you. We thank thee for your presence here because you have promised where we are gathered, you are with us. We thank thee for our church family, the opportunity we have to comfort, comfortably come and seek thee and worship thee. We pray that you'll accept our worship today, sinful as we are as we come to the throne of grace. We pray that you'll cleanse us and that you will make us whole again. Continue to create in each one of us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. That in turn we may continue to uphold thee, uplift thee, and glorify thee in all that we do. And above all else, may we seek thee first, knowing all other things will be added unto us. We pray that you will bless every head bowed on here. Help us to grow in our Christian walk of life. May we nurture one another in your love and grace. We pray that as a church family, we will be a blessing to the community around us, that we may share your love and shine your light. We thank thee for, we pray for the many people in our church who are in need of thee. For those who are not feeling well, we pray that you'll reach out to them and heal them. For those who are facing life's difficulties and challenges, we pray that you will meet their needs according to will and plan. And wherever we can be of help to any of them, we pray that you'll open the doors, that we can be there for them. 
There are many who have come forward here. Lord, you know the desires of their heart. Reach out to each one of them and meet their needs, whether it be a song of praise or something of concern, that you will bless them. We thank thee for our school. In a few weeks, as they prepare to open the doors again for a new year, we pray that your blessing will rest upon the staff, the students. Pray that you'll keep them safe, that they may have a wonderful school year and be a blessing to the community here. We thank thee for our pastor. We thank thee for his ministry to our church. Bless him, bless his family. And as he brings us your message this morning, we pray that you will speak through him, that it will be, that it will draw us nearer to thee and be a blessing for us this coming week. Continue to bless us through the rest of the service. And when we leave this place, may we truly say that we have been in your presence. And may this joy is carry us through the coming week until we come here to worship you again, till you come to take us home. And finally, may each one of us be found faithful to go home with thee and live with thee forever. For we ask these few mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, children, it is time for children's story. But before that, there are a lot of adults here with big dollar bills who will be handing them over to you. So come on over. And after that, just stay put, because we have a story for you. Good morning and happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Is it weird that I heard the adults more than the kids? Good morning and happy Sabbath, boys and girls. <laughs> no, you're, no, you're good, trust me. <laughs> we have a, today is a very special day, my friends. And it's not just because it is the Sabbath of the Lord our God, but we have ourselves a birthday girl among us. That is none other than little Miss Lebaton right here, looking like an absolute princess, I must say. Yep, it's, it is, yep, today she turns one years old. Ain't that special? 
Like, join me in wishing her a happy birthday, shall we? Happy birthday. We are very, we're, honestly, we are very happy that you are here with us, and, on, and we wish you many more birthdays for the years to come. Now, for today's, for today's children's story, let me start off by asking you all a question. Is there anything that you all have that's really special to you? Any of you? Anybody want to share? Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Yeah, you know, if I had something special, I probably wouldn't want to share it, too, just because, you know, don't want anybody taking it, you know? Anyway, there so, anyway, there once was a boy named Tony. Let's call him Tony Broncado. That's an awesome name. And he lived in a big city with his family. Now, his family didn't have much. They didn't have much money. They didn't have too many possessions. But that didn't really matter to them, because at the end of the day, they knew that the Lord God was always with them. Every single night and every day, they would pray to God and thank him for the blessings that they did have. And they knew that no matter, they knew no matter what, all material possessions were nothing compared to the grace and love that the good Lord provided for them. They always had each other and they always had God. So on Tony's eighth birthday, you see, his grandfather gave him a very special gift. It was a shiny, minted silver dollar, and Tony absolutely plots at this. He thought it was the prettiest, most shiniest silver dollar in the world. And there was never a day where he walked by and he did not show it off or tell everybody, look at my shiny silver dollar, isn't it great? And he thought, man, imagine all the things I could buy with this. Which I mean, you know, in today's economy, I mean, a chocolate bar is pretty much a luxury, so what's he gonna buy with it? But he still thought it was amazing. Until one day, the unthinkable happened. Can you guess what happened? Man, you're psychic readers, I tell you. Yep, unfortunately, the poor boy lost it. He had no idea where it went. He tried to look every floor for it. He looked under his bed. He looked in the basement. He looked in the attic. He asked his mom and dad, Mom and dad, where's my silver dollar? Where's my silver dollar? He looked outside where he played. He couldn't find this thing. He even did the unthinkable. He actually went to school on a Sunday to look for it. I know, I know, shocking. And, and then he looked everywhere he could until he eventually just gave up all hope. And so that night, he went into his room, he started to cry, and he was just so bummed out that he thought, I'm just gonna go to bed, I can't do this today. I lost my silver dollar that my grandfather gave me. It was the most special thing I had. And so he got in his bed, and as he began to close his eyes and he had prepared to drift off into sleep, a small voice in his head he heard say, hey, Tony, aren't you forgetting something? You forgot to pray. You do that every night. Well, why should tonight, why tonight, why should tonight be any different? He kept trying, and you know what? He just kept thinking, no, get out of my head. I don't want to think about it right now. But the voice just kept saying and saying, Tony, you forgot to pray. You forgot to pray. And so finally he decided, okay, you're right. I have forgotten to pray. So he got down on his hands and knees. He prayed, God, he prayed to God. He said, God, I thank you so much for all you do. And, I, and, I've, and I'm sorry that, you know, I've thought that the silver dollar was more important than your love and your mercy. But please forgive me and forgive me of my sins. And forgive, me, and forgive me of anything else that I may have done, Lord. And as he got back up, he put his hand down on the ground. And then he felt something cold, circular, metallic in nature. And what was it that he saw? Bingo. Silver dollar right there. And he just burst with joy. But at the same time, he thought, you know what? It was great finding this and all. But the fact that the Lord my God answered my prayer is even more powerful. So remember that, boys and girls. No matter what material possession you own, it never compares to the power and amazingness that is the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For his love, his mercy, and his grace is worth more than anything in the world, even a million silver dollars. Thank you. So, would anybody like to pray? 
my man. Oh, Lord, our Heavenly Father, thank you for today, Lord. Lord, help us not to go against you, Lord. Lord, help us to, to like, think about you more than anything else because he, you can do anything and you can make anything. So, anyway, if it's a dollar, you can make another one. Lord, help me to be good and everybody to be good. Lord, help everybody to follow you one day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen to that. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everyone. Between us, thou light a mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the wind. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows.
praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living For that awesome special music. I'm so glad Grandpa and Grandma are here to hear it. So you, you have a very talented granddaughter. And even Eric's kind of talented, so. <laughs> you know. Oh, I've worshipped already. How about you? Amen. Beautiful. It's been good to be here today. You know, I began this series, and we, we conclude with the third sermon in the series today. I began it with a quote from Ellen White book, Desire of Ages, a quote I heard many times growing up, but really stuck with me and one I agree with. It's where Ellen White suggests that it'd be good for us to spend an hour every day pondering the life of Christ, contemplating his life, what he went through, what he taught. And she says, especially those closing scenes. And so as we focused on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, those closing scenes of Christ's life, I hope that it's refreshed in your mind that story. And this morning we want to look at Sunday, and Sunday comes, and I'm going to look at it through the lens of John, the apostle, in John chapter 20. Of course, all the four Gospels include Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. In fact, it's interesting, they spend more time on that final week of Christ's life almost than the rest of his entire ministry. And so you can tell for the gospel authors, for the disciples, it was important that we understand that that final week was really what it was all about. Everything we need to understand about Jesus, we see it in these last closing scenes And it tells us those truths that we need to apply and understand in our lives. In John chapter 20, if your Bible has headings like mine does, uh, mine says, the empty tomb. The empty tomb. Now, I want to preface this by reminding you this is not an Easter series or an Easter sermon. What I'm challenging us to do is to take this time as a congregation to corporately reflect on Jesus and what he did, and to see the stories maybe in a new light, to relate to them in their humanity, to relate to the disciples, the people in the stories, to see that this was a real event and what it must have been like for them so that we can understand the truths that are here for us. And so in John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So Mary Magdalene, she comes. Now in the other accounts, there were other women that probably came. John just lists her. She comes to the tomb, and she's wondering, you know, what can we do? We'd like to finish kind of preparing the body. Who's going to roll the stone away? All this stuff. But when she gets there, she's stunned. 
stunned because the stone has been rolled away. And now she is wondering what happened. And we pick it up in verse 11. Verse 11, Mary stood outside the tomb doing what? Weeping, crying. And it says that as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And there she saw two angels in white seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. By the way, what does that remind you of? An angel at the head and one at the foot. Exactly. There was this thing called the Ark of the Covenant with two angels, one on one side, one on the other, and in the middle, the mercy seat. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, that's another sermon, not today's sermon. She sees two angels through her tears, her blurry eyes look in, and she sees these beings, and they ask this crazy question. Woman, why are you crying? Well, she says, they have taken my Lord away. I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned, in verse 14, at this she turned around and saw who? Standing there. So she's looking in the tomb. Two angels. She's crying. Why are you crying? Because he's not here. Where'd he go? They stole him. He's gone. I loved him. I can't believe this happened. She's mourning. She's been through a very traumatic weekend. She turns around. There's Jesus. The one, by the way, she's crying about. But it says very simply, she did not realize it was Jesus. She did not realize. She looks at him, but she doesn't see him through the tears. The tears, no doubt, hindering her view, clouding her vision. And I think this can happen to you and I in our times of suffering. That sometimes in the pain, we don't see Jesus, even though he might be standing right in front of us. I remember when I was in high school, I had this biology teacher. He was, he was very popular, but he was getting older. He was near retirement age. And he had this habit that we all thought was hilarious. And it was hilarious because it happened over and over and over again. And it went like this as he was teaching us. It would come to the moment in class where he would need to read something from the textbook. We had this huge biology textbook. I still remember it was the heaviest one in my back book, back backpack. And so sometimes he'd open the pages and read a quote or a definition or something that he was explaining. And in order to read from the biology textbook, he would have to have his reading glasses. He, he just couldn't do it. And he would inevitably ask, where are my reading glasses? And he'd be looking around on the desk, moving papers and everything. And every time, guess where his reading glasses were? Always on the top of his head. And of course, being teenagers, we would never tell him. And this just happened over and over. And we would laugh. And we would just start laughing while he's looking. At which point, sometimes he would turn to us and go, guys, do you see them? Where are they? Like, Mr. Robertson, they're on your head. Sometimes kids would be doing this. Like trying to give him a clue. Every time it came to read, oh, shoot, where's my glasses? Oh, that's right, on my head. Bring them down. Right there, same place, still couldn't find them. Forgot. And we couldn't believe that he would forget every time. They were always on his head. In fact, I don't remember a time when they were anywhere else. But he was always looking out here for the glasses when we felt like he should have remembered they're going to be on your head because that's where they always are. You know, I shouldn't mock him because I do feel like there is something lacking in male genetics. And women, I think you've already observed this. Uh, men are kind of slow to admit this or recognize it. But there's something in the male DNA where we have really a hard time finding things. Have you noticed this? If you send a, if you send a man to get you something, it's going to be hours of, I don't see it. 
honey, where'd you say it was? Are you sure? And then it's the emphatic, it's not here. I'm telling you, I'm looking right at it. It's not here. And then the woman comes in and goes, it's right in front of you, and pulls it out. Have you had this experience? It's humiliating. It happens over and over. And I know I have a teenage male in our house, and whenever we send him to get something, he can never find it. And, we, and then we're shouting. You know how that works? You know, you're shouting from rooms. It's, in the, it's on the left side. Look, it's not here, I'm telling you. And then you walk up, there it is. Well, I can't pick on him because this week I remember I was sent to get a Tylenol, a Tylenol from our medicine cabinet with all of our medicines. And I was told specifically the bottle of Tylenol was empty because it had been put in the travel case of Tylenol for a trip we had recently taken. And the purple case is right there, just get it. And there's Tylenol in the case, at which point I went and spent an inordinate amount of time until I was fully satisfied that that purple case was not, in fact, in the cabinet, at which case I somehow stumbled on another Tylenol bottle. So I was very excited, opened it, and there was a Tylenol. And I thought, well, I beat the system because it wasn't in the purple case, but I found another bottle. And I was about to walk triumphantly away until I saw, dead center of my view, the purple case which I had just not seen for like a half an hour, it seemed, probably like a minute. But it was exactly where she said it was, <laughs> exactly in my view. And I found some obscure bottle that had fallen over in the back because I couldn't see the thing that was right in front of me. It happens to us at times. I don't know why men are particularly bad at it, it's just my observation. <laughs> Something genetics, don't blame us women, it's our DNA. So, in this case, Mary, struck with grief, she has just watched everything she believes in be crucified on a cross. Her Savior, her Lord, her teacher, her friend. She has been through all these traumatic events this weekend, and when she gets to the tomb, all the promises and, and prophecies that Jesus had made about his resurrection are long forgotten. You know, that's the danger, by the way. When grief comes, when trials come, when challenges come, when we're blindsided by something we didn't see coming, it can knock all those promises out of our vision. It can knock the faith out of us at times. Even those of us that are solid, good believers even those of us who can handle some of the little things in life. Sometimes there's something we just didn't expect. And we're left reeling from the blow. Heart crushed, anxiety up, fear. And suddenly our faith is tested. And so here's Mary in that condition. She's crying at the tomb of Jesus. And she's crying because the, the Jesus is not there. And she turns in verse 14 and looks right at him. And doesn't see that it's him. Woman, Jesus says to her, why are you crying? Now, if I know Mary, she's probably thinking, oh, man, somebody's asking me this again. Don't you get it? I'm hurting. This is terrible. I've lost somebody. I'm in pain. Why does everybody keep asking me? Why are you crying? But then Jesus asks a second question. Who is it that you're looking for? And the Bible says, thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him. And I will get him. And then Jesus said to her, one word. What did he say? Her name. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I want to suggest to you that in our times of grief and challenge, in our times of suffering and trial and loss, in those times where it seems we are forgotten and abandoned, that those are actually the times when Jesus is closest. I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with the, the poem entitled Footsteps. 
perhaps next to the Bible, one of the most famous pieces of spiritual literature, and there's all sorts of uh, posters and pictures, and they put it all over different little icons and emblems, and people have it in their houses. And, and the basic premise of the poem is that the person is so upset because they went through all these trials, and they look back on the beach of this journey they took through all these trials, and there's only one set of footprints. Where were you, God? Why was I on all alone? And the poem says that God comes to this individual and says, there's only one set of footprints because I was carrying you. I was carrying you. And you didn't even know it. And here Mary, she's staring right at him and she thinks he's the gardener. She thinks he's someone else. She can't even recognize who it is. And in her grief and in her trial, she misunderstands. And it's like that with us. Grief has a way of changing our vision. It has a way of changing the way we see things. One of the most uh, threatening things to any, mar any marriage is a tragedy. When tragedy strikes our home, maybe the loss of a child, maybe uh, some other tragedy, they say that marriage can be in jeopardy. And the reason it can be in jeopardy is because tragedy changes how we see things. And we start to look at our spouse differently. We start to look at our home differently. We start to look at our family differently. And it starts to create a wedge and it's a very natural thing, and it can happen to any of us, or it can happen to all of us. But God is still there in the trial. And this story is in the Bible. It doesn't have to be there. It's not significant. The most significant thing is that Jesus has risen, that Jesus is alive, that he paid the price for sin, that we're forgiven, that salvation is sure, that he's defeated the devil. Yet there's this crazy little story about this woman crying at the tomb. She wasn't even, this wasn't even Peter or John. This wasn't even one of the leaders of the church. This was just a, a woman who loved Jesus. Someone, we're told in another case, who, who at one time had demons cast out of her. Someone who clearly in the past had a life of trouble and trials and probably was not the most respected member of society. So why is this story of this troubled, challenged woman by the tomb in the Bible, weeping and crying? What's even more amazing is what Jesus says to her next. After he says her name, and she remembers, and, and it, it, it voice connects all the dots for her that, wait a minute, this is Jesus. The one I'm looking for. Jesus says to her, verse 17, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Instead, go to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now this is powerful. Why is it so powerful? Because of what Jesus has just done here. Jesus has not even gone to his father yet. He's resurrected from the tomb. He's, he's back to life. He is brought back from the grave. He has conquered death. He has paid the price. He has redeemed humanity. His mission is accomplished. He has burst forth with light and an earthquake and all of this. We know that his next stop is to go to heaven. We know that all heaven will be rejoicing and celebrating over him. We can't even imagine the welcome party and the, the entrance that he is going to receive when he comes home. But he stops somewhere on his way. And I don't know how Jesus travels. I don't know how God works all that out. But somehow, on his trip back to heaven, he stops because he hears his friend crying. And he goes back. And he shows himself to her. And only her. 
And he does that first. That's the first thing he does after he's resurrected. And the resurrection must, the resurrection must have just happened. She is fresh on the scene. She went there right in the, while it was just getting to be sunlight, right at the break of day. And Jesus hasn't even had time to go back home, to celebrate with his father, to be reconnected with the father he loved, that he has been separated now for 33 and a half years. He stops to go back and to comfort Mary, to say her name. That says a lot about my God. You know, it's interesting because at the only other resurrection, nine chapters earlier, John chapter 11, the story of a man named Lazarus, there was another Mary, and she was crying. Some say this is the same Mary. We don't know exactly if it was the same or two different Marys. But one thing we know is that at this other resurrection, there were tears that were shed also. But what's interesting in John chapter 11 is that Jesus began to weep. In fact, if you grew up in Sabbath school like I did, and if you had a little sticker chart in your Sabbath school where you got rewards for memorizing Scripture, John 11.35 was your Scripture. That was the perfect one because it was only two words. You could memorize a whole Scripture by memorizing two words. Jesus wept. But what's crazy about that scripture and what's crazy about that story is why in the world was Jesus weeping at Lazarus' tomb? He had nothing to cry about. He was about to bring this guy out of the grave. This was about to be one of the greatest celebrations this community had ever known. This miracle was going to be the greatest of all Jesus' miracles. This is going to be talked about, sung about, praised about. This is going to spread his fame far and near. Why in the world is Jesus crying at Lazarus' tomb? In fact, it even says the people looked around, they saw him crying, they said, wow, I guess he really loved Lazarus. We didn't expect this reaction, even from Jesus. But he must have really loved this guy. Mm -mm. The Bible's clear. He was crying at Lazarus' tomb for the same reason he stopped his journey to heaven and came back for Mary's tears. He was crying because our God is moved by your tears. That's all. It doesn't go beyond that because there's really nothing for those tears to be crying about. In both cases, both Marys are going to have the men that they're looking for be alive. So there's not much use or point in crying because what they think is a terrible thing is actually going to become a really awesome thing. And in both cases, God knows that. But he still is moved by their suffering. He's moved by their tears. People say, where is God in my suffering? Where is God when I went through all this? Listen, I don't know exactly why certain things happen, but one thing I know is God is moved by your suffering. He is moved and touched by your pain. He sees your tears. There's somebody listening today that this was the message God had for you. This is what he wants you to know. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what's on your mind. I don't know what's made you cry this week. But I want you to know Jesus was crying with you. And he wasn't crying because what happened was so terrible. You know? (laughs) Jesus, come on. This is humorous, really. She's crying about Jesus being dead and Jesus is comforting her. Do we see a little bit of irony here? She doesn't need to be crying. The angels rightly asked, why are you crying? There's nothing to cry about. The one you're looking for, he's alive. In fact, in Luke, it has the angels saying to her, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Like, you are in the wrong spot, honey. This guy ain't here anymore. And by the way, he told you this was going to happen. 
You've forgotten, but that's okay. No judgment. By the way, I'm glad God isn't like us, right? I mean, God could be so sarcastic with us because we are, we are very hypocritical. We are, we are a mess. We're foolish. We, we make fools of ourselves all the time. Even Mary can't even recognize Jesus when he's standing right in front of her. But there's no sarcasm from Jesus. He just says her name. Mary, I came back. I just want to tell you, it's okay. It's me. I'm alive. Got to go to my father. I'll be back. Tell my friends. I'll meet them in Galilee. It's all good. Okay. All right. Good. See ya. Bye. Got other things I got to do real quick. Be back in a minute. I mean, what God must think of how easily we lose sight of all of his promises, of all that he is capable of doing. Every time God is able to do something more miraculous than the tragedy that occurred. In fact, God seems to delight in using tragedy to make something beautiful and something miraculous. Sure, Jesus should have come to Lazarus sooner. Sure, God, if you had come earlier, my brother wouldn't have died, said Mary and Martha to Jesus. But you know what? The miracle was in the fact that he didn't come. If he had just healed another person, it would have been another story. It would have been one among many hundreds that Jesus had healed. But God has something special to do in the story with Lazarus. And God has something even more special to do in the death of his son on our behalf. Now, I don't know what you're going through. I know that we on this earth are always going through something. And the whatever it is that has been the cause of your tears lately, I can assure you God can handle it. I can assure you God is and may have already, and you just haven't seen it yet, may have already done something amazing about it. He can bring good out of suffering, joy out of pain. He can bring happiness where once we thought there was forever sorrow. In fact, he delights to do that. And so many times we come to the tomb expecting nothing but death, expecting nothing, no hope, having lost sight of the promises and thinking there is nothing my God can do. That tomb is sealed. That stone has him blocked in. There is no hope and we can feel hopeless. But I've got news for you. The living Jesus is not in the tomb. He's standing in front of you and he says to you the same thing he says to Mary. He calls your name in tenderness and love to gently remind you, I am here. By the way, this comes full circle because if I were doing the Christmas sermon, we would start with the name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. We are not forsaken. We are not abandoned. Even in the times when it most feels like we are, those are the times when he is closest. But guess what? We might think he's just the gardener because we don't recognize in our pain and in our tears what he's up to, what he's doing. But I pray for you if you're in one of those times, and I'm sure somebody is, because it's a sinful world and the devil's always active. I pray for you that you'll hear his voice because he's calling your name. He's calling your name and maybe this sermon is him calling your name today. Maybe you sense it, maybe you feel it. I just beg of you, he's got a heart of gold. He is touched by your suffering. It was never his will, it was never his wish. This is the result of sin, but he's with you in the pain. He's with you in the loss. He's right next to you because you're so important to him. He would stop his own party to come and to weep with you. 
<laughs> you know that song, it's my party, I can cry if I want to. All right, you got to be a certain age to know that song. Sorry, kids. There's an old song. It's got this catchy little tune. I used to sing it all the time, not because of the words, but just it's very catchy. It like gets stuck in your head. You know, it's my party. I can cry if I want to. I don't know. It's, it's somewhat weirdly empowering, but then why are they crying? I, I don't even t- pretend to understand why it was written. But I do know that when it is your turn and your time to cry, my God is right there with you. No matter what, he stops everything. He is touched. Let me just ask you, parents. I know we've got a number of parents in here. When your children is hurting, does it get your attention? When you see your child weeping, if you see your child crying, if you see your child in pain, does that not move you more than anything? More than anything. Even if you know they deserve it, (laughs) even if you know uh, there are times where it's so easy, you could easily come to those moments and say, I told you so. I told you not to, and you still, and now look at you. But when it's your child, somehow you just pick them up and you hold them close and you rock them in your arms, you do whatever you can, you patch them back together. You take them to the ER, whatever you need to do, you do because they're your child. And even when they get older, it doesn't change. You still want to help them in their suffering, in their pain. You can't help it. And if we feel that way as humans, imagine how much more our perfect source of all love, how much more our infinite God who loves with a love we cannot fathom or even imagine. He wants to be there for you in your suffering. He cares about your pain. Now, one day we'll understand a lot more about why things happen. But right now, we may not get the answer why. But the one thing we can count on is that God is with us. He may not why us, but he's with us. He's always there. That is the message from the word. That is the message from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. Our God is Emmanuel. Our God is the one who is with us. Our God is standing there in our pain. Our God is coming to us in our tears. Our God is touched by our infirmities. Our God is moved by our sorrow. That is the God that we serve. That is the message that he has for you today. When we look at Sunday and we think of the glorious resurrection and the triumph and and coming forth from the tomb and making a way of salvation, all of that is incredible and powerful, and that's one sermon. But I want you to take home today that when you think about Sunday, also think about the God that even though he is the one that suffered, even though he's the one that bore the pain, even though he's the one that was naked on the cross, even though he took our shame, even though he took our guilt, even though he was separated by our sin from his father, even though he experienced hell for us, he is still touched by our crazy little tears and our worthless little pain over things that don't even exist. He's still moved by our heart. Now that's an amazing love that I can hardly comprehend except to share it with you today and tell you that it's true. Our God is is touched by your tears. Please stand with us and sing our closing song, Wonderful, Merciful Savior.
Father in heaven, we are touched and amazed by this love. Jesus, that you would care about our tears in the grand scheme of this entire universe and all that is on your plate and all that is in front of you and all the things and people that are so much more important than us. And yet, each tear, every pain, it tugs at your heart. We are so amazed that you would care this much about each one of us. May we instead, in these times of suffering, may we remember this story and the promise and the faith and trust you that no matter what comes, all of this leads to a resurrection, to new life and eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much. God bless. Have a great week. We hope to see you again next Sabbath.